so much for joining us today on our webinar. Um, so I'd like to welcome you uh, to Paving the Path, How School-Based Health Centers uh, Can Engage Youth to Pursue Health Career Pathways. Um, so the uh, goal um, of this webinar is to provide an overview of our curricula for school-based health center youth engagement programming. Uh, so before we begin, I wanted to go over a few webinar housekeeping rules. Uh, so everyone uh, is in listen-only mode. So uh, you do have two options to join us today on the webinar. So you can either um, call in through uh, your phone or you can join us on the web. Uh, but phone tends to be a bit better in terms of sound quality um, and um, establishing a more secure connection. So if you are um, calling in um, and accessing the webinar from your laptop, the call-in number is listed here um, along with the access code. Um, so you call in the number and then um, input the access code when instructed, followed by the pound sign. Um, if at any point during the webinar you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box and we will address your questions um, as they come. Um, so the chat box is located in the sidebar uh, to the right of your screen, so you can address um, us privately um, as the presenter, um, or you can um, address uh, the attendees and the panelists. Um, if you do experience any technical difficulty, so if you still do um, hear any audio um, from the video uh, when you're coming on, please let one of us know, um, and we will address that um, as soon as possible. Um, I do also want to note that the webinar is being recorded and will be available uh, for public access uh, within a week um, of this webinar. We'll upload this to our website and uh, I will give you more details on how to access that after the webinar. And in addition to the webinar itself, supporting materials will also be uh, uploaded on the webinar section of our website. So the objective of today's webinar um, is our hope that you'll be able to, one, describe the youth health worker and learn me practice curricula, two, to practice activities uh, from the curricula, and three, um, identify a plan for implementing and integrating the curriculum into either new or existing youth programming that you may be thinking of or are currently partaking in. Um, and also, uh, we hope that uh, you will learn um, from our panelists today that uh, we'll have a chance uh, that we'll introduce uh, just in a moment um, to learn from uh, their successes, their challenges, and uh, their uh, opportunities that they have identified um, in their youth programming. So this is the outline of what we'll be covering today in the webinar. So we'll start off with a few introductions um, of our panelists. We'll talk a little bit about uh, the California School-Based Health Alliance, um, and then I'll talk briefly uh, about youth engagement concepts and best practices, and then we'll provide an overview of our youth health worker curriculum and project, uh, followed by a few sample lessons from both curricula. Um, and then we'll have uh, we'll be joined by our panelists uh, from uh, Juan Crespi Middle School uh, and Pinole Valley High School, um, who are both uh, from the YMC at the East Bay. And then we'll close out with any uh, Q&A or any questions or concerns that uh, you all have um, to, that you can either ask um, me or our panelists. Uh, so to start off with introductions, so um, I'll start off. Um, so uh, my name is Peter Lay. Uh, I'm the project coordinator here with the California School-Based Health Alliance. So I oversee all of our youth engagement efforts, uh, including our own youth advisory board. Uh, so I've been with the organization for about five years now, uh, starting off as a youth board member, and then eventually working my way up to youth consultant, um, and into the current role that I am with now. Um, so I oversee our youth health worker program and curriculum. Um, so if you ever had any questions or would like to learn more about it, um, you can uh, contact me. Uh, so now I'm gonna pass it over uh, to Kenitra uh, to introduce herself. 
Good morning, everybody. I'm Kenitra from Juan Cresty Middle School. I've been here. This is my third school year and my second school year doing um, the Youth Health Worker Program. And I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Kenitra. And now I'm going to pass it over to Reginald. Hey, Reg, can you hear us? Hey, Reggie, can you hear us? So, Reggie is experiencing some technical difficulties um, at the moment. Um, I'm, back. I'm back, I'm back. There he is. I'm back, my bad. Dang, what happened to my thing? Hey, Reggie, do you want us to go ahead and introduce yourself? Sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm Reginald. I'm the director of community schools at Panola Valley High School. I've been doing youth work for a good 17 years now and hope I can provide some information that help people. Great. Thank you so much, Reggie. All right, so moving right along. So to give you a very brief overview of the California School-Based Health Alliance, uh, so we're the statewide nonprofit uh, that's supporting 268 school-based health centers and counting. Uh, we're always excited uh, to see this number expand as the years go on. Um, and uh, for those of you that are in the field, um, School-based health centers um, are called many things depending on the uh, line of work that you're in, so you might um, know them as wellness centers, you might know them as health clinics or health centers or wellness clinics. Um, there's a lot of different ways to describe um, a school-based health center, um, but for the purposes of today, um, we're um, uh, going to refer um, to them as school-based health centers. Um, so each school-based health center um, is different uh, to meet the multifaceted needs of the students and community that they serve. Um, so no, uh, school -based, no uh, two school-based school health centers are the same, um, and they offer um, a combination of medical, dental, mental services, um, in addition to youth engagement programming, which will be the focus of today's webinar. Um, in addition, uh, we also work with uh, school districts to identify services uh, that are most needed um, or most uh, requested by young people. Um, and um, so far, um, the greatest need uh, that has been identified um, is mental health uh, and trauma best practices amongst youth uh, statewide. Um, and our work is really grounded in two basic concepts. So one, we wholeheartedly believe uh, that healthcare uh, should be accessible to where students spend the majority of their days in schools. Uh, so we uh, really want to bring health services to school campuses so that young people don't have to miss out on school. Um, and also, uh, we believe that um, schools should be equipped uh, with the essential services to ensure that poor health isn't a barrier to learning. Uh, we believe that in order for students to be successful, um, that they should have quality access to health care so that they can be in optimal health um, and grow up uh, to be successful adults in our society. Uh, so today, um, while we talk about youth engagement, I wanted to briefly talk about our role um, in youth development and engagement. So as mentioned earlier, we believe that um, preparation for productive employment is, essential, uh, part, is an essential part of adolescent health. And we believe that school-based health centers are, are well-positioned um, to connect youth and health professionals um, to improve the quality of their life. And in doing so, uh, we are able to promote health careers um, in four different ways. So one, by offering youth leadership programs uh, for students who otherwise wouldn't have access. 
Um, two, providing access to a multidisciplinary medical team that includes primary care and mental health um, care, as well as health education. Um, so providing that well-rounded uh, care that's essential for youth and meets their multifaceted needs. Three, um, supplementing opportunities to access healthcare development beyond specialized academic um, and career focus clubs. And four, reducing transportation barriers that youth often face uh, when trying to access uh, services. Uh, so real br briefly, I wanted to uh, talk about uh, this theory um, called Roger Hart's Ladder of Young People's Participation. So uh, for those of you um, that are in or currently uh, doing youth engagement, you may have heard of this. Uh, but for those of you that are just starting out, um, I think it's a great starting place um, um, and um, idea to build um, and expand your youth programming. So if you look at this graphic, you'll see that uh, there are eight rungs, and each rung describes a level of uh, youth participation. So um, at the very bottom, you have um, the rungs one, two, and three that really illustrate um, kind of tokenization of uh, young people. Um, and typically, um, th unfortunately, this is very common where we see young people are being used um, as decoration. Um, they're not being used for um, their individual ideas, but rather they're being tokenized um, and um, oppressed. So. Um, Roger Hart describes these rungs as um, adultism or youth oppression, and that's definitely not uh, where we want to see um, our youth programming happen. And as you get higher up in the rung, you start seeing um, the level of youth engagement uh, becoming more, um, more um, substantial. So um, with rung four, you see um, at this level young people are being assigned and informed, um, they're not being quite engaged. Um, and um, rungs five, six, and seven is where you really start to see some uh, youth engagement. Um, so currently, a lot of youth programming that exists um, happen at one of these rungs. Um, ideally, we would like to engage youth at the upper rungs of rung seven and eight, where youth uh, adult partnerships can exist and take place, um, and where youth can participate in the uh, decision making or power sharing, if you will. Um, and this is also where youth are engaged as activists, um, and where adults serve as allies and not accomplices. Um, and to add on to that, I will say that uh, it's okay, um, depending on where your programming is at, um, we see a lot of people um, at these, you know, rung four, five, and six, because of constraints that may be due to grants or deadlines, we understand that adults uh, juggle multiple responsibilities uh, in their workplace, but also outside. Um, so. Of course, um, you know, again, we want to see youth engaged at these upper rungs, uh, but it's also a challenge, um, and we understand that. Um, and to do so takes years and years of practice and uh, evaluation. Um, but um, in theory, we would like to um, see youth um, being involved from the very beginning where they can share in the decision making. So, um, Many of you that are on this webinar um, may be at very different stages of your youth programming. It may very well be that you're just interested um, in learning about how to start a youth program. It may be that um, you want to start a program, you've taken those initial steps. Um, it also may be the case that you have a program and you're just looking for best strategies or you're looking uh, for new directions. Um, or ideas to uh, build on your programming. Or you may be a veteran and have um, done youth programming for years. But no matter where you are um, in your um, programming and engagement with young people, um, there are things that you need to think about. There are three core things um, that are important for anyone at any level to think about. 
Um, so the first, I would say, is funding. And that's always a huge barrier for anyone that gets in this line of work. Um, and funding can come from a variety of sources, whether or not you apply for small mini grants um, that are you know, local or community-based, or if you go um, for the bigger grants uh, with Kaiser Community Benefit or TCE. Um, those, um, um, and I'm sure many of us know that funding for youth work is very challenging to come by. Um, so funding is always a major barrier um, for youth engagement, and uh, typically most youth programs um, uh, utilize funds for um, snacks, t-shirts, stipends, whatever it might be. Um, so funding is always an important consideration no matter where you are um, in the youth engagement process. Um, another one um, is staff time. Um, so questions to think about, um, can, do you have um, a dedicated staff person that can work with these young people? Uh, do you have someone that has the skill set and the knowledge to work with um, young people that come from different walks of life? Um, and do you have someone that is truly invested in the development of young people? Um, these questions are really important to consider um, when you are thinking of starting a youth program or trying to sustain your programming. Um, because you definitely want to ensure that um, the staff resources are not only there, but also consistent, as we know uh, that um, building relationships or meaningful and authentic relationships with young people um, involves having a trusted adult ally um, that uh, is present um, and can resonate with the experiences of young people. And last but not least, um, Another area um, to think about is training. So um, in training your staff, um, who um, has the capacity and the resources to provide that knowledge and skill set for your staff? Um, so I will say that um, we here at the California School-Based Health Alliance um, are able to offer uh, trainings um, to our participants and adult allies of our Youth Health Worker Program. Um, so for those of you out there um, that would like um, training, on um, developing your youth programming, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, my uh, contact information will be at the end, but also um, feel free to um, contact our uh, panelists who will share their experiences uh, today as well. Um, and real briefly, I just wanted to show this graphic um, that we created um, that illustrates the five key elements of authentic and meaningful youth engagement. Um, so one, um, inclusiveness, and equity, two, respect and affirmation, three, authenticity and vulnerability, four, trust and accountability, and five, flexibility. So these five elements are crucial um, in engaging young people in meaningful and authentic ways. Uh, so to give a brief overview of the Youth Health Worker Project, um, this project is currently implemented at 10 school-based health centers across West Contra Costa Unified School District. Um, so I'm not going to read off each school, but um, to summarize, we're um, at seven high schools, and we're also really excited to have been able to expand this work uh, to three middle schools this year. So um, in this list, I've bolded Pinole Valley High School and Juan Crespi uh, Middle School because uh, we're very fortunate today to um, have the adult allies from those schools join us on the webinar. So the Youth Health Worker curriculum is essentially um, it formalizes uh, the peer education and the health uh, coaching um, that young people have already been doing um, as part of their youth engagement programming at their school-based health centers. Um, so this um, exposes young people to health career pathways. Um, and the Learn, Meet, Practice curriculum um, is more of the practice. So the youth health worker is like the theory. Um, learning practice is actually getting young people out there on the field, exposing them um, and introducing them to uh, health professionals. Um, so for example, mental health providers, primary care providers, alcohol and other drug counselors. Um, we have curriculum um, that um, help young, that set up young people to meet these professionals so that they can learn about what the profession is all about. Um, so to give um, some brief overviews um, of the curriculum, so uh, the Youth Health Worker curriculum introduces young people 
um, to very basic uh, public health and community health concepts. So here we have um, a module um, on the socio-ecological model that introduces um, students to um, the idea of uh, prevention and um, um, health at multiple levels. Uh, we also uh, recently added an immigration module on, um, that um, walks young people through how to create um, a sanctuary space at their school by creating posters. Um, and most recently, our most recent update um, has been to our mental health module, which has been identified as the greatest need, um, where we have um, created a trauma-informed module um, and a module on how to um, help young people um, make referrals uh, to their school-based health center um, for students that may be experiencing a mental health crisis um, or issue of some sort. Uh, so this is um, our most built-out module. Um, and if any of you would like to learn more about it, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, so this is a snippet from our uh, learning practice curriculum. So this is more hands-on uh, where uh, we provide uh, the information uh, for young people to learn about uh, the pathway to a certain uh, career. So here what I have shown um, is um, a pathway for a young person that might be interested in doing something related to mental health. Um, so not only do we provide um, the uh, information uh, such as the minimum degree required and um, a description of the profession, uh, but we also provide um, modules on helping young people develop questions that they can ask these professionals to learn more about uh, that pathway. And uh, we have this for a variety of professions outside of mental health, again, so in primary care, dental, whatever it might be. So with that, um, I'm going to pass it over to our first panelist, uh, Kenitra, um, who's going to talk about um, her work and implementation of the Youth Health Worker Curriculum at uh, Juan Crespi Middle School. Good morning, everyone. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. I had to do a little move. They started drilling on the heater, so you hear a little bit of noise. I had to move next door, but it's still a little loud. Um, I'm glad to be here, so let's get right into it. So at Crestby, we have something that Peter mentioned, um, a wellness center. We call it a wellness center. It's created as a safe space for the youth here, and it's where they come to get the services we provide, which are mental health. Um, the county does provide medical services um, three times a month, if there's a fifth week in the month, and also um, drug and alcohol preventive services, and like I said, clinical services, and then the youth engagement piece. So um, as you can see in the slide, it was started about three, two, three years ago. I've been here for two years, and I'm just going to go over a little bit of how it's working for me. I'm new to this a little bit, still kind of young, unlike my counterpart, Reggie, who's been doing it for years and years. Um, here in middle school, it's, I've found it to be a, just a little more challenging because as you all probably know, middle school, they're still trying to like find themselves and figure out what they like and who they like and who they want to hang out with. So um, a part of the challenge in that is getting them to agree to something and stick to it. But um, how I end up recruiting my youth health workers, and here we call it the Youth Advisory Board, which is the YAB. They have several pieces and several things that they do on campus. Um, I open my space up at lunchtime as a safe place for the kids, the students to come and eat their lunch, play games, talk, meet other people, and do things like that. So usually the students that come in more frequently, I've built a relationship with them and then asked, hey, do you want to be a part of this and explain what it was? And most of them were okay with doing it. Some were a little shy and some would come to a meeting and then decide not to. So recruitment is kind of 
something we're still kind of working at. I try to get, once I get one young person to agree, I say, hey, bring one of your friends and try to build that way. Currently, I only have four members in the Youth Advisory Board because a few basketball started, so a few others decided to go and do other extracurricular things. Um, but it's, it's a learning process. So I'm learning, they're learning, and we're just moving forward and taking those bumps in the road as we can. Um, second thing I want to talk about is um, curriculum. Um, so as Peter stated, the curriculum is, was established, and for middle school, what I found is it's a little more advanced. Like some of the wording and some of the topics are just above their head. So how I've adapted it to here is we take topics, I put it on our agenda, and we openly discuss those things. So we've discussed the, the help module about mental health and how they can support their peers and even family outside of here. And we've also discussed the pathways to certain health careers and um, just trying to help them understand certain words and certain things so they, it kind of like sparks their interest and then we have an open dialogue and if they have questions I answer them and we do just basically things of trying to develop their leadership skills and them being okay with asking questions and talking about things that they maybe have never talked about. Um, the successes I've also found are um, we've opened a lot of these eyes to healthcare professions that they maybe wouldn't think of because most of them think when you say, oh, do you want to go into a healthcare career? They think doctor, nurse, dentist, and that's pretty much the, the gist of it. But in introducing them to pathways and how they can get safe, they've seen other things and also begin to ask questions about things that could possibly fall into um, a health career category, like per se an esthetician, somebody who wants to help people with their skin and do things like that. So I found that that's a success in saying that it makes them think outside of the box. Um, and also my youth advisory board here is a part of our school's um, climate. So with them doing things like we do healthy food tasting, we also pick healthier snack options for the students to try weekly and we have harvest of the month. There is a garden that's growing here. So we're trying to implement things that help the school population in general, just kind of step outside the box and try different things and think a little differently. And I think when it comes from a more um, a youth voice, they tend to take it in a little easier. I'm basically just the adult presence. I kind of try to let them lead and make decisions and, you know, hash it out amongst themselves and not step in as much as I can, just so they can build their confidence and try to develop their own thoughts. I do help when they ask for it, but for the most part, I want it to be run by them and not really pushed by me or any other adult on campus. The challenges I found in middle school is just retaining my members. So I started out with eight and now I only have four and just a matter of getting them to commit to and agree to not miss this many meetings and participate with this and do those types of things and in middle school it's just kind of they're a little finicky for lack of better words they could like it today and not tomorrow and decide they don't they'd rather do something different which is fine I'm just struggling with keeping the students engaged and keeping them wanting to be here and not having to choose between um, this or that and trying to be able to allow them to do both if they want to um, the other challenge is the curriculum level, like I spoke to before. Just for middle school, it could be a little bit advanced at times. So for anybody that's in the middle school level, I would just say um, adapt it to what your needs are on your campus. So 
so often I kind of flip through the curriculum and see is there something in the curriculum that the school population is going through at the moment and then bring it up to my YAB and we discuss how we can help or what things can be done to possibly change it or improve the student population's knowledge of certain things. So I just try to make it more of a free flowing kind of thing and make it fit where I can and how I can. Um, and that allows them and makes them feel like they're really doing something more than me saying, we have to talk about this in this way, in this time, in this you know, format. Um, and then as far as the future plans for our youth advisory board, again, is recruiting, of course, is number one, and trying to get the kids to be um, more open to going out and saying, hey, I do this, would you like to do it too? And kind of promoting it on their own as well as um, in March, we plan to have a college and career week where we will highlight certain health careers and the pathways and how to get there and kind of open up the door and the idea to something other than just a doctor or nurse or dentist. Um, and also here at Crestby, they've, the students have expressed a concern about not having access to water. So helping them build a plan and then execute that plan on how they can get access to water here for them to drink. The school has now made it something they have to purchase and often they don't have the means to purchase water. So just we're going to do a survey and then have them think of ways that they can help improve that concern for their peers. Um, if anybody has any questions or any concerns maybe that I could possibly address just from what I've been experiencing here, I can open it up to questions. But other than that, I'm still really new to this and I'm learning with them, for lack of better words. I'm learning as we go and doing the best I can. I'm kind of a one woman show over here, so I hold many roles and wear many hats. So I'm trying to give them as much um, freedom to do as they see is beneficial for our school campus. Great. Thank you so much, Kenitra, for sharing your experiences and being so real with us. Um, so um, as Kenitra said, if any of you have any questions uh, specifically for Kenitra, feel free um, to type them in the chat box and we'll address them at the end um, of the webinar. Um, so with that, uh, we're going to pass it over um, to our next uh, panelist, uh, Reggie, um, who is at Pinal Valley High School. Um, so Reggie, whenever um, you are ready. webinars so I really appreciate you being here right now um, obviously I'm from the Pano High School Health and Wellness Center I'm the community schools director um, youth development is actually the one thing that I actually love about my job I like everything else but I actually love this piece um, I get in trouble oftentimes for doing a lot of direct services but if you're going to get a bunch of paperwork and meetings out of me, you're going to give me a little bit of the youth development piece that I like to do too. So just to hop into it, I um, this is kind of a matrix of how we work. Um, we're a community school, uh, official full-service community school, and pretty much everything runs through this office off like of a hub-and-spoke model, our ideal situation is to get a referral and respond to it in 24 hours. Now, that doesn't mean the student is going to accept services or that they'll be able to start that service right away, but we will at least contact them, bring them in, put hands on them, hug them, tell them we love them within 24 hours. Um, we have two youth <clears throat> leadership teams, and I only included them 
as a way to discuss sustainability and the possibility of leveraging your other trainings and your other resources to have a great youth leadership team and a great youth health worker youth advisory board. So they're a little different. Um, youth advisory board is education and youth health worker field. Tobacco program is more of tobacco use prevention and education. They both have discussions around health and safety of the school, but TUPI focuses more around the student uses of tobacco. Um, we help define community health and how community members access community health. Um, uh, TUPI is more in the education of deception of tobacco retailers as well as the tricks they use to get young people to use tobacco products, and they both provide direct services to the school community. Recruitment, you know, why these, those kids, who's in charge, when do we start? Um, youth Advisory Board should have a good mix of young and old students. It should involve staff to give opportunities to support their students. And what I mean by that is if a student, if a teacher has students that he or she have been working with and wants to provide some other opportunities but doesn't really have a way to provide those opportunities. When you approach teachers with these ideas about TUPI and Youth Advisory Board, it gives them a way to give their students something back too, like whether it's a club or benefits to belonging or some of the other perks that come with being in a youth leadership group. Um, we like to provide information on what's expected before offering benefits to belonging. So with the youth health worker curriculum, you receive a stipend, but we don't tell the students that until after they've gone through the process of becoming a part of our youth advisory board. Um, we try to appoint a student leader early, and we try to change roles and positions every year. So if you were, like, basically a team lead for youth health work, youth advisory board last year, and you come back to the program this year, we'll ask you to do something else, like treasurer or secretary or note taker or something to that effect. Um, we start recruiting on the last day and the first day of school. So the last day of school, as your seniors are going out, we try to get them to give us, introduce us to juniors and sophomores who coming in will be like basically meeting you at the health center, ready to get started as soon as school starts. And then we do another recruitment at the beginning of school year. Um, same for Tupi, good mix of young and old students, work with existing program coordinator for talent. So. If you have somebody that coordinates 2B or if you have someone that coordinates other leadership activities like leadership, BSU, uh, stuff like that, then you can go to those groups for, you know, talent to see if they could work with your program. Um, look for students who've never been engaged in any other activities on campus. And ask your principal if you can address your freshman class as another opportunity that the school is offering. Activities, themes needs implementation. Each year we target a specific problem and kind of make it our thing. This year, for example, is suicide prevention. Um, why this year? Mostly because it's been the most often reported issue in our health center. 15, 17 years, this is the most referrals I've ever gotten for self-harm. So once I brought that to our youth advisory board, they were more than happy to like kind of attack the situation. Um, needs are usually discussed through surveys, usually after a lesson in the youth health worker curriculum, or something that caused a lot of debate or discussion. So we like to do a poll. Let's take it to the student body. Um, surveys are our main source of information from our student body. Um, implementation. Our students spend most of the winter, and that's after getting a good team together. So I'd say about October through the break and uh, up through February, we're basically training in our groups and doing icebreakers, getting to know each other. Um, our youth advisory board has been working on our nutrition grant that we have with Contra Costa Health Services. And um, as the facilitator, I often use a guide after gauging the climate. So sometimes we might kind of skip through because we've done it for so long and get to different activities that we know will be vital to kind of what's going on in the community or something going on in our state's, in our, you know, the country's climate. Um, this time is basically spent gearing up for the spring. In the spring, we send our students out to partner with elementary and middle schools to provide instruction to the younger students in our community. And our high school kids really love it and get excited about it. In the spring, our students will provide peer education this year to the students of Collins Elementary, which is a two-block walk from our high school. 
peer education is a hallmark of our youth program. Being able Everything to teach happens. what we have learned is a true final for the class of being a youth health worker. It encompasses every module. And then I was going to show a video, and I guess I'm part of the tech difficulties. But this is um, a video from a project our team did at JFK a few years ago. And it's just an example of what our youth health workers kind of teach and the projects that they do with the lower grades. And finding a solution becomes as effortless as it is. Great. Um, thank you, Reggie. So we're actually going to um, try and share the video. Um, so um, again, for those of you um, that have joined us um, on the phone, um, we apologize um, for the background noise that you're here. It's not you. Um, so Reggie is actually um, at Pinot Valley High School on the ground running, um, which is just the beauty of working with young people because you're always there with them. Um, and that was their uh, daily announcements. Um, so we're going to go ahead and um, try to share the video here. Um, and if it doesn't work, uh, we will send out the link for you to see uh, the video. And the video is just students from our middle schools doing some kind of um, doing surveys in the built environment and making contacts with the store owners of local liquor stores in their community and checking the food for healthy options as opposed to um, non-healthy options. It's one part of it. Great. So we're queuing up the video uh, right now. Nice. That's dope. You can divide our
great. Thank you so much, um, Reggie, for sharing uh, that video. Um, so with that, uh, we are going to go ahead and uh, transition uh, into our uh, Q&A. So if um, any of you have any questions, uh, please start um, typing them into the chat box. Um, and if a uh, few have come in, um, so uh, this is for uh, both of you, uh, Reggie and Kenitra. Um, so um, do you um, have uh, any uh, advice for people that are just starting their youth programming? Can you, if you wanted to um, address that question? Um, I would say because I'm fairly new and how I addressed it was first building a relationship with the youth. So then I would have a better opportunity of asking them to be involved in something that I'm coordinating or facilitating. So I just basically opened up my space for them to come in and say hi. We talk about random things during lunch. And then from those students built basically a little community of students that come in and then invited them to participate in the youth advisory board or youth help worker program. And that's been the best way. Um, for me, as far as middle school, and then like Reggie said, um, after they agree to it in the terms, then later in the year, they're informed that they'll receive a stipend, so that helps as well. Great. Thank you, Kenitra. Uh, and Reggie? Um, I honestly feel like, too, starting with a younger age group, I think if it's new, if you're in high school, start with your freshmen. If you're in middle school, start with your sixth graders. And I think mostly because you got an opportunity to work with them through the summer and then going into the next couple of years if you just starting this kind of program. So I think starting young is important if it's new, if it's a brand new program. Great. Thank you so much. Um, and we have another question. Um, about how um, you engage or um, how your experiences have been uh, with engaging young men um, in the youth health worker curriculum. Um, can um, either of you speak to that? Can you try? Um, do you have any thoughts? I definitely feel like um, the recruitment process for young men, it, it can be difficult, but it's also providing a space for them that they can feel comfortable and providing topics that they're into is important. I think that um, checking in with all of the um, on-campus activities that are already going and looking for talent that's already participating in activities and then asking them to recruit people and provide benefits for that. Um, for me in middle school, it's been a little more challenging, like I said. Um, the majority of my youth advisory boards are young ladies. I did have two um, males, but once basketball started, they kind of chose to go do that. So I would just say, like Reggie said, trying to provide or offer something that they can be interested in too. Um, what is my benefit is because there are a larger number of girls than, than boys, the boys usually tend to want to come, like, oh, I want to be around the girls, especially at my middle school, there's only seventh and eighth grade. So um, the seventh grade boys are really interested in being involved in something that the eighth grade girls are doing. So that can be a benefit to a certain extent, but it is a little more challenging to get the boys involved and committed to doing it. They'll come once or twice, but getting that long-term commitment is, is a little challenging and I haven't quite figured out how to get around that. Great. Thank you for sharing. Um, and we had another question come in um, for both of you. Uh, what resources uh, can you both offer, aside from the youth health worker curriculum, um, to um, our participants um, to either uh, develop their youth programming um, or start their youth programming? Um, 
I would I would say um, like Reggie, there isn't one. I would say survey your students and find out what they're interested in, and then build upon that. So um, you don't want to start something that they just have no desire to learn about or no interest in at all. So I would say figure out a way you could survey them and um, also going to those other possibly um, activities that are ha happening on campus and recruit from there or survey there and find out, hey, what are you interested in? I'm trying to do this and I'd like it to work out like this and see who is interested. That would be my best. Um, and then just, just be authentic and what would you like to see and what would you have liked when you were in high school and middle school or wherever you're trying to build your youth program and just go from how I did it. And with help from people like Reggie. So I do call Reggie and say, hey, what do you think about this? Or can you help me with this or support me with this? And then it's a theme kind of around our agency right now, but leveraging our community partners. So if you have YMCA on your campus or Catholic Cherries, I'm not sure where people are calling in or, or where they are receiving this information, but other community-based organizations that provide services on your campus, if you collaborate with them and let them know that you're developing this group and that you might want them to participate, they also have trainings that they can deliver. Some of them are also on grant where they have to reach a certain amount of students to do certain things like classroom management, um, surveying the public, community-based research process. All of those kind of things are people that you want to leverage that you can use with minimal funding. Also checking in with your science teachers and your health academies for any kind of curriculum they have around sexual health, teenage sexual health, um, identity, um, gender sensitivity, all of those kind of, um, how do you say, trainings that your staff has had to attend over the summer to prepare for the school year, those curriculums can also be modified to teach students about youth health and how to provide direct services to the community around youth health and education. Great, thank you for sharing. Uh, we had another question come in. Um, can either of you offer any suggestions for school-wide events? Yes, um, school-wide events. Um, I think one thing is doing school-wide surveys. Principals are interested in getting that data back about eating habits. It's um, also, um, there are a lot of things that you can survey your entire school for, but also like, again, you have all the national events that come up, like for us, National Suicide Day, and you order ribbons, and then you do a moment of silence throughout the entire school. And those are things that you can, simple implementations that you can do that don't take a lot of logistical work. Um, you can hand out ribbons to all the teachers, have the students come out, do photo booths, social media, create a hashtag for your campus around promoting some kind of healthy um, educational piece, whether it's sexual health, whether it's tobacco prevention, uh, whether it's drug awareness, um, whether it is trying to get access for health care for undocumented students. Like there's so many things that you can attach your group to and do a school-wide activity around it. Um, lunchtime is a good time to do a school-wide activity. You can do music. You, you can do handouts. The last year, instance, um, there's I a lot of times sure. during the day now, where you can participate the yourself, with the entire school ball, student ball, body without it costing a lot of money ball. either. Thank you, Reggie. Kenitra, did you have anything um, you wanted to share to that question? Um, just like not much different, just what he said about serving the students and also you filling out the climate of your school and deciding possibly what would be beneficial at that time and then letting the students kind of run with the idea. Um, and also think about things that are already going on at the school and then piggyback on it, like maybe open house or 
during that beginning of the school year when they have um, assemblies, like in middle school, they have like a seventh grade assembly and an eighth grade assembly and possibly doing something during those things to promote whatever theme or idea you have going and, or to implement it at that time. So lunchtime, things that are already in place like back to school night or open house and then any standing assemblies or anything that the principal or administration have going on. Um, I would just say things like that. And like Reggie said, picking like all these national days that they have now, like um, my youth advisory board participated in national get to know your classmate day where they just basically chose somebody new to introduce themselves to and have lunch with and they could have had lunch in the wellness center or in the cafeteria but it was something they promoted they made posters um they made an announcement during the school but it was just something small it wasn't anything that required a lot of manpower or logistics so it was easy and pretty successful for what it was Thank you, Kenitra. Um, and I will just add in real briefly, along those lines, um, there is a national health event calendar um, that'll list um, all of the health events that um, happen each month. So you can just easily Google that um, as a starting point for some inspiration um, for a health event. Um, so we are right on dot um, at noon. Um, so if um, there are any further questions, please feel free to reach out directly uh, to Kenitra, uh, Reggie, or myself. Um, but with that, we're going to close out. So I uh, briefly wanted to invite everyone um, on the webinar to uh, become a member of our organization where you can uh, have access to both our youth health worker and our Learn Me practice curricula, in addition to a plethora of other amazing resources um, that will um, enhance um, your uh, youth uh, programming. Um, and uh, with that, I want to thank you all uh, for joining us on this webinar today. Uh, we hope uh, that um, you found some usefulness and value from it. And um, I just want to close out on the point that uh, Reggie and Kimitra had alluded to, that that's this work uh, definitely is collaborative in nature. Um, so we hope that um, you all tap into your network and establish meaningful partnerships uh, to engage young people um, in uh, promoting uh, health career pathways. Um, so to close out, um, all materials um, and a recording of this webinar will be available um, by the end of this week on our website. Um, so we'll include the link uh, to the video that Reggie shared as well. And again, if you have um, any um, questions that come up after the webinar, um, please feel free um, to send them our way. Our contact information is included um, in the webinar. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your week. Bye.